Welcome back to another episode of Creator Conversations. Of course, I am your host, Danny Marie, joined by another esteemed guest, one of my favorites, believe it or not, because I just feel like I've learned so much. I feel like you are such an intentional person. And through the experiences that have shaped you, I just admire so much about who you are, what you do, what you represent, even in my very short time of knowing you. I feel like you are a person of your word. You are a man of integrity. And that to me is motivational and aspirational as I'm raising two little kings. So I'm looking up to you and I don't say that to very many people. None other than Knowledge himself, Knowledge Born Allah, joining us on Creator Conversations. How are you? I'm happy to be here in your presence. Bless. Your excellency, okay, the best in the Pacific Northwest <laughs> and in the world. Thank Ms. you. Ms. Danny Marie, thank you. Thank you. Blessings. So on Creator Conversations, we talk all things about your creative outlets, your creative journey, the things that have inspired you on your path. And hopefully some of that will connect with the audience who are maybe like me, late bloomers to content creation or people who feel like they've hit a crossroads on their journey. They don't feel inspired. So I'm just hoping that something you share, which I know will impart wisdom and inspire the listeners, the audience today, starting off with the fact that you are a podcaster and you've been on your podcasting journey for almost a decade. <laughs> so tell us a little bit about how you got into podcasting for starters. Excellent question. Storytelling saved my life, made my life make sense, and gave my life a new trajectory all in one. So that story has intersectionality between my past, my present, and my future. So if I say storytelling, it deems or denotes fiction. But storytelling also denotes nonfiction. So the imagery in your mind, the nation of imagery that's in your mind is limitless. It's boundless. You can see your past. And you can see your future in your imagination, but you can't see your present. Your present is relegated to the two eyes that you have in front of you. So my podcast journey is the intersectionality between myth and reality, fiction and nonfiction. And all of the stories intersected within the shape and sphere and scope of all of that. So. I got into podcasting with a story to tell. I just didn't know how far that story was going to take me, change me, resurrect me, and then in turn help others in the same sort of fashion. So I got in it to tell the stories of the unseen, the unheard, the unsung, and the voiceless. And along that path and trajectory, I went, to meet all kinds of people, the voiceful, the boisterous, <laughs> and so many people in between. So yes, storytelling is something that shaped and changed my life mm. and it will change my life forever. Yeah. And I know that you're on a trajectory to help, I think, 100,000 people through your podcast. And I want to get into some of that a little later. But I heard you just say, your podcast helps, or when you started off, it was a mission to help bring voice to the voiceless and the unseen. Did you ever, did that ever resonate with you personally at any point in life, maybe through adolescence or childhood where you felt you were a part of that community, the voiceless or the unseen? Well, being Black in America, it is very, very easy to be misnomer and to be misrepresented. And the trajectory for this mandate that I'm on a mission for is one million Black stories not told 
or if they were told, they're told unrighteously. So we grew up in the era of television and television shows. To see a black face on television was everything. To see a, a black face on the late night talk shows or on the you know the television, it meant something. But the networks found a way to distort the images. You know, it goes all the way back to about uh, 1915. And the goal was to vilify black faces on television before black faces ever even made it to television. It would be about 40 or 50 years before a black face was really on television. But they had white images in black face. So white personages donning blackface to vilify blackface so that when the vast majority saw those faces, our faces, they would run in horror and we would be the villain. So in turn, they would be the hero. So, of course, in that space of not in victimhood, but in recognition, understanding that and finding creative ways to tell our stories started from young. Uh, but I think my mother is still the greatest spark in regards to my passion and love for storytelling and story seeking. I want to go back to how TV, how the, the Black story and the narrative has evolved so when i grew up of course it, and i'm um a millennial i'm an 80s baby when i grew up the cosby's and then the 90s fresh prince of bel-air and martin lawrence and full house and family matters all of those shows were prominent and the life lessons that we got from watching those shows, especially for like families such as myself who didn't have a father in the household, we really looked up to a lot of these figures. I want to go back to like, how has it all evolved? And I know that you said there are people who are very intentional about tarnishing the name of the black tarnishing the legacy, the name and what we the depiction of black people in television. Are you happy with the state of the culture now where we are as a culture, how we are depicted currently? You know, I know that there are people like you who have initiatives that are trying to change the narrative. Is that enough? Should we be doing more? What are your overall thoughts about that? Sheesh, that's a lot of questions. That is I a know. lot of questions. That was me in the moment, just like, where are we as a society? Are we getting any better with accessibility, with the fact that we do have more access and we can change our own narratives? Or are we still falling short compared to where we were when we had the Bill Cosby's on TV? I'll take my time, yet I'll be succinct. My overall assessment is no. My overall assessment is that we have devolved. We haven't evolved. The Cosby Show wasn't an involvement. The Cosby Show and The Different World and a couple of those other shows that were there, there were seeds as to what the imagination can do beyond the circumstance. However, with the cinematic offspring of Norman Lear and the gang, they had bound oversight into just how far the envelope could go on television. Like a television show like Rock, a television show like Rock was bold, it was powerful. So they said, oh, this is bold. This is powerful. Oh, they have Malcolm X on the wall in the home. Let's fix this. Let's fix this. Let's put 
this rainbow coalition push in the house and let's get let them be married in this house let's take a figure that we loved shaft right let's put shaft together uh with this european in rock's home in the sanctuary with malcolm x on the wall let's do this in front to spite them, okay? Let's just show them, hey, I can put my finger in there and distort the whole thing. It doesn't destroy the show. However, it seeds the show so much so that the people that played on Cheers made regular appearances on the show. So this is this beautiful Black show, beautiful Black family, hardworking, uh, husband, garbage man, Wife and nurse, they they together. They had a couple generations in the house. They took in a sister. You know, father got locked up. They had their own child. They went through every kind of pain and stress and strife. It was so real life. It was against the drug pushers. You know, uh, 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 family friends. It was every kind of thing that you could see. All in one, right? All in one and given opportunities for hip hop artists and R&B artists. It was so great, but they had to drip that little drip drop in there to distort it. They had to drip. And this is the devolvement in regards to the television. So even as far as your imagination can go, the diameter in regards to what they would do to spite your face. Again, 1915, if you go from 1915, to 2015 is 100 years. And then if you go from 2015 to 2024, it's nine years. So that's 109 years since they vilified Black people in the cinema with this movie called Birth of a Nation. So now if you look at a 109-year time span, where have we been? Are we still in Blackface? Are we still vilified? Did the imagery get better or did it get worse? You look at these TV shows, they got power, they got this, they got that. Look at our imagery. Are we still criminal? Do they still have slave narratives on television? Yes. So these things haven't changed in 109 years since the first quote-unquote image, not the first black person, but the first image depicting someone black. So... We had to fight through Tarzan. We had to fight through Buckwheat. We had to fight through Aunt Jemima. We had to fight through Uncle Ben. We had to fight through every sort of caricature in all of the periodicals just to have young Black creatives with our minds and hearts in the right place, but not the sort of diameter to see beyond the circumstances on how they see themselves. So a negative perpetual self-image will only recreate what it sees. Mm-hmm. So they think, okay, this is what sells, and I want to sell, right? And I want to sell out. I want to make a lot of money from this. So there's a lot of money for your distortion because it continues to follow and feed the narrative of villain. Because villains either get brought to justice or they get exterminated. Mm. So that's how it works, right? So you can have a a cinematic assassination in the mind. So when it happens in real life, it doesn't matter. The video games say this. The music says this. The television says this. The movie says this. The magazine says this. These people must, something must be wrong with them. They must be stopped. So it's just seeded, and it works over time. So in that entire process, the stories of the the beautiful young Black people, those beautiful families, those hardworking families that's doing everything that they could possibly can to make the ends meet and take their children to college and have them have better lives, we don't see those stories. We don't see them. We don't see the single mother. We don't see the single father working, making everything happen. And their children, we don't see their children. We see these preset images of gangsters, thugs, criminals, 
slaves. You know, all of these things they show on loop, on loop, on loop, on loop, on loop, from one generation to the next generation. They keep showing the same things. So even when we get in the driver's seat, quote unquote, right. we recreate the same things. We recreate the same things. So that perpetual cycle of self-infliction and self-harm and self-damage that's regulated by this unseen force that doesn't take any blame or responsibility for anything, it happens. So that assessment is, no, am I hopeless or am I hopeful? I am very, very hopeful. I am very, very hopeful. I've been around some beautiful, young, creative Black minds, and they're in their imagination. I said, what other stories can you tell? And they're like, I can, oh, this and 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 this. Yes, they have countless other stories to tell. So I'm very hopeful in the mind of these young um, Black creatives that exist around the globe. They just have to be reminded. So with this project of going to find these stories around the globe, one million of them, it's a way to turn the tide. But you ask, is that enough? No, it's not enough. That's my contribution. Mm -hmm. But if everyone shared their story righteously, if they shared the stories of their family righteously, we could tip the scales and knock this other stuff out of their park. People could be doing family projects, home projects, neighborhood projects, the people in their schools, their teachers, all of those people who look like them, people who made a difference in their life, share these spaces with them and be intentional about showing the positive aspects and imagery. We've seen enough of the negative. We know that it exists, but we know it's also not the majority. It's the minority. It's the minority from amongst us. So where's the majority of that? Where's that majority attention that's there to give the credence in the old? Even if you don't share with anybody other than your family, your family will know. One of the beautiful things that I learned from Muhammad Ali was as if he could predict where he would be later on in life, where he couldn't talk in the way he needed to talk and communicate where he needed to communicate, he began recording for his great-grandchildren. Everything, every place. He was saying things, everything that was on his heart, was on his mind, all of that. So now his grandchildren and their children and his legacy can benefit from those tapes that he made long ago. But he had the foresight that God put in his heart and in his head, and he did it, and he was obedient to it. So it's hundreds of tapes, hundreds of them. So they don't have to think about, well, what did my granddad, blah, blah, blah. You can go listen. You can go into his world in his time. You can translate. You can go back. I know they're watching and listening with tears in the eyes like, man. So if we had some sort of family space where we had some cameras, some audio, whatever it was, to be able to tell those stories for our loved ones and for our family members, they won't have to wonder. They won't have to wonder. They can hear it from you. So if you write it well, if you sing it well, if you dance it well, if you speak it well, whatever you do well, use your gifts and your talents to share a legacy of greatness for you and the people that are around you. If you love them, love them, them in the way that you capture the essence of them so they can be remembered for all time. Mm. Mm. Oh I can't smile with my other hand. I wish I could. Oh my goodness. Okay. So beautiful. So powerful. I want to go back to, if I can sum up in one word, what I heard you say through the stories of like birth of a nation and the depictions of people like Unjamina and Buckwheat conditioning. People have been conditioned for a very, very, very long time. People have been conditioned for a very long time through television, through media, through the news and just depictions all over. And that's hard to break through. Some people don't even realize that they're being conditioned. Have you always been in the know or woke? Did your family kind of teach? I say woke because I know that some people 
despise and loathe that term now because it's been overused. But that's the only way that I can explain wokeness, understanding exactly who you are, where you are in this culture and, and getting out of the conditioning, the mindset of being conditioned. Have you always, were you raised that way? Did you kind of come to this awakening and epiphany sometime during your adolescence or your adulthood? Did your family raise you that way? What what's the what's the story behind you getting outside of that whole conditioning and just knowing exactly what's happening, the reality of what's happening? Oh, that's a beautiful question. A beautiful question. And my answer is simple. Yes, all of the above. All of the above. I was I was thankful and blessed enough by Almighty God to be born into a family. And my mother and my father laid a path for me. We made an agreement in spirit. We chose each other. Mm -hmm. I chose them to be my parents, and they chose me to be their child. And that was the agreement. So us being cognizant of what it was, they prepared for my arrival, and I prepared for their arrival because that's a covenant, that's a bond. So my ancestral lineage set it up. God set it up in that kind of way for it all to work together in tandem like that. So I was born to my mother and my father, and this is where they were. This is where they are. This is who they are. They are consciousness because God is consciousness, intelligence, force, and power. So they were all of those things. And I came into the, the planet on, at my mother's and my father's highest spiritual point, their words. I was born at their most evolved spiritual point. So from that, I descend. So I read the books very young. We did the course of study. Everywhere my mother went, we went. You know, everywhere that Mary went, the lamb was sure to go. So my mother took us to college with her, we took us wherever she could go. And whatever we wanted to study as a family, we took it as a course of study. So whatever my siblings liked, that's what they gravitated towards. So for me, I, I gravitated towards, you know, my own path, but it was written in my destiny plan before I ever even got here. So there were no illusions about it. And I tried my best my hardest understanding to not do what I was destined to do. I wanted to know what it was going to be like off of the path, okay, over here in the corner. I wanted to be the prodigal son. I wanted to be whomever, whatever, right? But in that path, like with Joan in the well, even though he thought he was getting away, he was getting closer. You see what I'm saying? So for me, it was, I would look like I was going away, but I was getting closer. And I had to know what it was off that path. So the twist and the turns, the the trial, the error, all of it, I had to learn it because when you see somebody in light condition, you could understand the position that they're in and you don't look haughty and you don't turn your nose up. You understand what I'm saying? You know how to identify with them if it's your mission to assist them. You can understand where that is. Like that uh, twelve step program, the twelve step program. Every single person being in that environment has had a day zero and a day one. Everybody in that environment, nobody was in there. They just walked in there like, "All right, I'm gonna chill here." No, we had a day zero and a day one, and everybody there, no matter how long they have clean and sober, knows that any given day. They could be back at day zero, and they have to go back to day one. So the reinforcement of that environment is for being prepared to receive everybody on their day zero and cheer for them on their day one. And every time they come back, 
they say hi to them. They say, hey, I'm such and such, and I'm a blah, blah, blah. They go like, hi, such and such. And, you know, they clap with them, and they share with them, and then their sponsors, and then all kinds of things, because they are reinforced with that spirit of one another. So that consciousness, that knowing, that looking to see what it is, is a very lonely journey. And then oftentimes you find yourself saying, like, why can't I just be like everybody else? Right? <laughs> the inverse is true. It was a movie called Damien, and the little dude was the son of Satan. And he figured out who he was, and he was upset for a half a scene, Miss Danny. I'm telling you, he said, No, why? And the next scene, he had all black on and he was getting busy. You understand? Once he knew who he was, he knew what the world was around. And he's like, Oh, it's time to have some fun. So even in the midst of that space that I just went on to describe, okay, I was born into a trajectory and I had a path and I tried everything to do, not to do what it was, but I didn't find any peace unless I was doing what I was supposed to do. I didn't find any peace. So there's a twist and a turn. There's a growth and a development. It was consciousness and now it's wokeness, right? It's corporate because they can market woke. They can... Uh, sell woke, people will buy woke and they can distort woke because it's theirs that's theirs, they can have it consciousness still belongs to us it's still ours, it's still a term that we use and it's a divine term you know they say consciousness means to be awake nowadays, that's not true conscious is to be aware of the divine essence and force in you, empowering you and will in you and not to succumb to anything because of that foundation. So what consciousness means is that act of or relating to that space of divine conscious that exists and dwells within you, knowing who you are truly. Not what role you are, not what position you are, who you are in your essence. And once you know that, it cannot be taken away from you. You can't even give it away. <laughs> you can't even get it away. I laugh because I've seen that scene in my head from The Devil Wears Prada where the guy's in jail and he's in jail with this black guy who's Jesus. He's in prison, right? This black guy, he's in prison. This guy, he winds up in prison. He's like, man, I, I, I sold my soul to the devil, man. He's like, I hope you got something good for it. He's So this is Jesus talking to the guy, right? He's not browbeating the guy. He's not disrespecting the guy. He's talking to the guy as a friend. He doesn't say I'm Jesus, but you know it's him. He said, I'm just a friend, homie. Just a friend. So he's telling them that his true essence could never be taken. He can't sell it. You can't give it away. So that divine consciousness that exists within you, that's you, you can't give it away. Can't nobody take it from you. So no matter what you try to do, you try to forfeit it, right? Like the prodigal son was like, yo, give me a piece of my inheritance. I'm out, son. I'm up out of here. No matter what he tried, even at his lowest point, he remembered that he could go home. He could always go home. He could always go home. So no matter how far away we get from ourselves, we can always go back home. So that consciousness, even it looks woke, it looks like it's not cool and nobody's with it and all that, you sound crazy and all of those things. When it's time to go home, you can go home. Just mm -hmm. like that environment, you can have a day zero, you can have a day one, and people are going to welcome you with open arms. They, they're going to hug you. They're going to say, hey, such and such, whatever it is. That's your consciousness. That's mm -hmm. your conscious community. That's you coming back into the fold of your divine self. So God's there. Your ancestors are there. Everybody's there. They're waiting on you. You want to go, ah, I want to, ah, I want to do this, right? <laughs> I want to do, I have to go, right? And then, then when you come back, they be like, hey, well, come on, come on in. And that's what it is. And in that essence and space, you can begin the trajectory on what your path was. Did you have fun up there? Are you ready to get back to work? 
That's what it was. Last thing I'll say really quick, really mm -hmm. quickly, yeah. was there was an episode of The Twilight Zone, and the guy who played on The Honeymooners, he said if he had one wish, he could do for humans like Santa Claus. And he was Santa Claus. Understand me? He was Santa Claus. He had forgot, though. So he was walking around, and he was, you know, abusing alcohol, and it was just like... He found this bag, and this bag was his. He didn't know it was his bag. He was out there giving people what their hearts desire, and the bag was empty. And it was like, well, what about you? What do you want? He's like, my heart is full because I gave everybody what they wanted. So it's like, well, if you could have something, what would it be? He said, if I had one wish, I could do this every year. And he walks and he sees a sleigh and reindeer and the elf like, hey, Santa, you ready to go? So he gets in the sleigh and he goes. So his heart was full so he could get back to his purpose. When he was not in his purpose, he wasn't fulfilled and he was doing harm to himself. So when we're not in that state of being, when we're out of tune and out of alignment with what is consciousness to us, somebody can provide you with something that can sit you down a trajectory to have you further and further away from yourself. But the beauty of it is you can come back. You can always come back. When I started Creator Conversations, I thought it was just about content creation and social media and how to navigate the landscape. But what you just helped me realize in this moment is our lives, our creative journey, and the beauty in how we are shaped through our life experiences and our circumstances and the things we thought we should have had that we didn't have access to, how all of that matters and how all of that shapes us. So Creative Conversations is a lot deeper right now to me today because of you. So thank you for that. When did you step into knowing and fully embracing? And when did you finally come at peace? So I heard you say that you fought for a little while your path and who you knew you were supposed to be and what you were supposed to do. But when did you finally settle into knowing? I want the audience to know that when I started, I, I called her the best in the Pacific Northwest and in the world. Okay, I just want y'all to know that. This is, yes, she was definitely the best, okay? The best. So I came into that awareness fully around 15, the same age as my mother. My mother began to teach at 15. I began my teaching journey, working with at-risk youth as an at-risk youth at the age of 15. So there was a catalyst. I was sent away from my home environment. I did too much to be in that environment anymore. So I got sent to military school. And this was my last chance, right? So I told you I tried my best to run away from the duties and responsibilities that I had. I just wanted to go play in the sun, right? So I was in an environment where that was not allowed. I was in a, a military structured environment where there's a thing that's not tolerated. It's called insubordination. It's not tolerated at all. It's, it's a total control environment. So I was in there, and I was everything but controllable. So I was in that environment of total control environment, and there was nobody that they could ever create that would be able to control me, okay? <laughs> so I was there, and I was rebellious. And in that rebellious state of being, 
there were so many people that got sparked from that rebellious energy. And that rebellious energy was the first time they got a chance to see themselves. So then I had to bring about an awareness through divine intervention, of course, of with great power comes great responsibility. So in that space of responsibility, that time away afforded me the space to understand what that was and the direction after. So I began that work there and that work continued for the rest of my life. So that coming of age sort of space was something that I ran into head on. I don't mean that it was perfected, but it was actualized. It went beyond theory into practice. And, you know, it's a life, you know, circulated on per perfecting that. So. Yeah. When I, that's so funny because I have a similar story. I didn't go to military school, but I was very rebellious, a very free spirited person. And around the same age, I went to Job Corps. <laughs> it took me same environment. Yeah, it took me coming to which which funny enough, Job Corps was on a military base, and a lot of those are. So um it took me coming to my meeting my match, Mary Huber. She said, Nope. We won't just have you be one of those people. So she actually harnessed all of that energy and she made me be like her TA, her teacher's assistant for the for the office assistance program. And it was actually office assistance in the county. So she made me basically be the TA and I was responsible for like teaching the social skills course before we would break out for the big sessions. And I think it just meant someone seeing in me all of that potential, all of that rage, all of that energy, all of that power, all of that strength and harnessing that and using it for good. Did you have any kind of, I know your parents were very instrumental. Did you have any other type of mentors who helped harness all of that energy in you and bring out who you are today? But there were some divine men. There were some divine men and even more divine women along that way and in my neighborhood if the elders spoke to you they saw something in you if they taught you something they saw a lot more in you so the elders they spoke they taught me things they sh shared things with me you know, some taught me martial arts, some reinforced some of the, the love for black history, took me to museums, different things like that. But my family largely was the biggest catalyst, my siblings, my aunts and my uncles, you know, uh, outside of my mother and father. They were there, you know, there were plenty of people. And then on every at every juncture, there was somebody. At every juncture, God knew. My ancestors knew that if I wasn't in front of somebody, sheesh, I was going to act a plum fool, okay? A plum, plum fool. So knowledge came from foolishness, okay? <laughs> knowledge came from playing, trying to play the part of the fool instead of seeking to be the part of the wise man. So I was out there acting the fool, acting foolish. So there were people who cared. My, my eighth grade teachers, you know, I was in the eighth grade a couple of times, right? And so second time was the charm. I had an eighth grade teacher. Uh, his name was Mr. Glover. I had another eighth grade teacher. His name was Mr. Rick. And those black men, let me tell you something. That black man, Mr. Glover, he was 6'4". He was 300 pounds. His wife was the principal. And he gave nadarn about what they had to say about us in his classroom. He said, they call y'all crazy. They call y'all unintelligent, and I'm not having it. And if you don't like it, you can go get your daddy and his three brothers. I said, why he keep saying that? I said, oh, yo, he prepared to fight our daddy and 
three uncles about us. So he ain't having it. So I was like, yo, this guy, that was a guy. You, you see what I'm saying? You know, uh, Mr. Rick, he was a science guy. He was a martial artist. He 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 taught us respect. Respect for ourselves, respect for women, respect as a, a young man, how to carry yourself, all of those things. He presented an image of professionalism. He was a guy that rode his 10-speed to school. He didn't drive the car. It's a different kind of dude, man. Different kind of dude, Miss Danny. He, so there were divine men and there were divine women. My, my teachers in school, those black women, they didn't take it. You know, my aunt, she didn't take it. My mama, she didn't even take it. No, no, no. There was there were women that did not take it. I was in the military. Every woman, black woman that I had in a leadership position, they was not having none of my foolishness. And they went the extra mile to make sure I understood what it was. And it, in turn, we took care of each other. We took care of each other. So... Uh, like, you know, you shared the story about your mother. Like, please, your mother and I would talk for 18,000 days. You understand what I'm saying? Like, please, just compare notes and share notes. Uh, so I understand the, the life that she lived in, the world that she lived in. So, yes, there were so many people, and I continue to meet people along this path. That's how I know it's a divine path. Because in the devolution, you meet the same person. That that lower aspect of yourself over and over. You don't meet uplifting people. You meet devolved people. That devolved aspect of yourself over and over and over and over. And they get worse and worse with each interaction. So yes, there were they were and there are countless people, you know, and people like yourself, you know, exceptional, God given, God sent. Bless, 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 bless. I just wanted to look up really quickly. And this is something that I'm getting a lot better at in my late 30s, believe it or not. It's looking at definitions because you can have, you can grow up with an idea of what a word means. But then sometimes as you evolve as a person, as you get older, you understand there are layers to some of these words. So going back to creative, relating to or evol involving the imagination or original ideas, especially in the production of an artistic work. Also, change unleashes people's creative energy. Noun, a person who is creative, typically in a professional context. So I wanted to look up the definition because I want to go back to martial arts. <laughs> how did martial arts and the training that you experienced, and I don't know how for how long, but how did that also spark creativity and make you to be the person you are today? I want I want my boys to experience that. So I would love to hear for personal reasons. The the martial arts, the martial sciences, the martial disciplines. Normally they're very short reasons why people get into martial arts. They, they don't always get into the martial arts for the sciences. They get into the spaces for martial disciplines. Martial is like control. Martial arts, martial law, right? You see what I'm saying? So uh, a, a regimented space of the martial sciences. So Muhammad Ali said he got into boxing because somebody had stole his bike and he wanted to learn how to fight. <laughs> he wanted to learn how to fight. So, you know, that young kid that went into that boxing gym, that's what brought him into the boxing gym. Uh, but he later figured out it was God that brought him into the boxing gym. So the, the, the martial disciplines had a profound effect upon me because it was it's just something to do. It was intriguing. It wasn't, hey, I want to learn how to hurt somebody or defend myself. It was just something that was there. And an opportunity presented by one of those divine men that I you know, told you about that you know wanted saw enough of me to want to teach it to me. So I went under that study, and that study sent me down a rabbit hole with many different teachers, 
throughout life. So you can learn the martial disciplines in the space of self-defense or in the space of psychic self-defense, in the space of health defense, in the space of wellness. There are so many principles that are there that are garnered. Meditation is a principle. Self-actualization is a principle. All of those things. The physical regiments are there to train the body. And the other aspects are there to train the mind. And to unite in harmony in one. The physical, the mental, and the spiritual. The fluidity that goes along with the movements. And the repetition that goes along with it. If you have to be in an engagement, you're prepared, but you're prepared mentally first. You're emotionally regulated in that space. So you're dealing with a trained individual versus an untrained individual. In most of those instances, with the training regiment that's there, the more training that's there, the less likely you are to actually uh, Engage with someone because you know what you can do to them. But if you have to, in Aikido, for instance, it says that when someone attacks, they violate the natural order of the universe. And you, as the center of the universe, are to bring them back into flow. Everybody read The Art of War. But not too many people have read The Art of Peace. The Art of Peace was created by the founder of Aikido. And these are some of his philosophies in regards to that. So even think about that. In Aikido, there are no punches. There are no kicks. There are only parries and locks and holds to bring people back into the flow. So when they attack, they violate the natural of the universe and you have to bring them back into the flow. Some people you can block, some people you can parry, some people you can Chinese sidestep, and other people, there's a wrist, there's a lock, there's a hole, there's something to subdue them, and other people you might have to break their arm for them to understand. So either way it goes, you are prepared. You're prepared. So it teaches you due regard for nature, do regard for the universe and your role in keeping things in the flow. So there's so many things to be taken away from the martial disciplines, but you go in there with one mind and hopefully you leave with another mind and that mind is more elevated. On your mission to share one million stories, first of all, I know why it's important i understand why it's important i believe in since i became a podcaster the digital footprint and leaving those stories behind and i think people are healed through storytelling when we hear stories the truth about who we are the truth about where we come from so i would love to know on your mission to share one million stories how you plan to enact that because 1 million is a big number. And then also, is that the pinnacle for you? Is that your North Star? Or what happens after you hit that target? Yeah, I'm telling you, she is the truth, okay? She is the truth, the truth of the truth. And the truth of the answer is I'm prepared to go how far I need to go and do what I need to do. That, that It sounds like it's cliche, but it's, there's a commitment. There's 3,400 episodes already and counting. I don't know the number currently right now, but there's 3,400. Now, 3,400 into 1 million, that's a number, right? It's just consistently going in the flow, and the digital footprint actually makes it easier. So... I could send a set of questions out to 10 million people and 1 million can record it and send it back and then I have 1 million black stories. So 
insurmountable. It sounds like it's an impossible feat, but it's actually something that could be done in 24 hours. You know, it's something that could be done in 24 hours. Now, the process of cultivating them and making sure that this is good and whatever and putting that out, that might take a process. But actually getting the stories in the digital footprint is something that's very easy. So literally, it's who, you know, out there that answers the call. Who's out there to answer the call. But there's a process. And then after that goal is reached, whatever's next, I'm prepared for it. I'm prepared for what's next. I'm prepared to do what's necessary to continue on the work until I no longer have breath in the physical world. And the baton will be passed to my children and their children. And, you know, uh, those who want to be the griot and facilitate the griot because the griot was charged with the task and the gift of telling the story. In the um, going back to legacy, um, the reason why I started when I first got into podcasting, I started the mother and daughter dual podcast at a time that I was at a crossroads, the height of the pandemic on the cusp of losing two full-time jobs. So it's not like I was just doing the one I was doing two and I was trying to do everything that I could. And then becoming a mom, losing my dad, the day after my son's first birthday, that was a lot for me to endure and experience. And I moved into podcasting because I said I need some space that I can talk about all of these changes and these things that are happening to and through me that I can't explain. I need a community. So that's how I moved into podcasting was at the loss of two jobs, becoming a new mother and the loss of my father. And from podcasting, I have grown to believe podcasting is art and healing. And I heard you say when we first got started, something similar. And I know that one of the things that you and I kind of connect on is that you also have lost a parent. For me, my experience with my father we had been estranged for so much of my life that I didn't even know how to properly grieve him at the time. And I do remember when my father did come to see me just before, like six months before he passed. And the words that I hang on to, do something great and do it with your sister who I had not been raised with. So that is like my North Star, in addition to my children. It's like, do something great to carry on this legacy for my children and for my father's sake. And I know that you, your mother, has passed and has transitioned. And I just wanna know what part of her legacy are you pushing forward through the work that you're doing? Every day through your podcast. Miss Danny, the miracle <laughs> worker, okay? My mother said, ask of Ness. Make them talk about it. Don't let them escape that. <laughs> uh, I was hosting an event. Mm. I think it was two years ago. I was hosting an event. It was a music festival. It was black culture. It was everything. And one of my queen mothers, she was there and they honored her at that celebration. And at that celebration, they honored her. And after she spoke, my mother showed up like, whew. my mother showed up and took me over. Okay. My mother showed up and took me over. She took me over. I don't know if you remember that movie Ghost or Whoopi Goldberg. When that man jumped in and he said, baby, what you done did with your hand? You like it? But my mother reminded me that if I stopped doing what I was doing, 
she stops. If I stop doing what I'm doing, she stops. She's not stopping. I'm not stopping. And in that space, I was talking to the people that were in the room. I said, we mentioned a bunch of great people today in your platform, and y'all said I shave for them, but I didn't hear anybody talking about their mother. I didn't hear anybody talking about their mother. I didn't hear anybody talking about their grandmother. I don't want to hear anything about you if I don't hear you talking about your mother. I don't want to hear anything about you as long as you're talking about your grandmother. I don't care what your relationship is with your mother right now. You wouldn't be here to have a relationship without your mother. I don't want to hear it. So, your mother, this is how you know life. Your mother, this is how you know God. Your mother, your mother, your mother. So that was a reminder. I was talking to the crowd via my mother, but my mother was the constant reminder. My mother is the reason for the podcast. My mother was the reason for me teaching in the streets. My mother was the reason for military school. My mother is the reason I am still here on this side. After my mother departed, so did I, Miss Danny. I left with her. I left the world with her. I didn't care about this side of life. I was gone. I was gone. It had grieved my soul, my heart, my mind. My spirit, it grieved me. I cried. Like Jesus on the cross, Eli, Eli, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? This was my tears, my cry, my prayer, seven to eight years, Miss Danny. Why didn't you just come get me? You know I would have left with you. She said, that's why I didn't. Your work ain't finished yet. So your father saying, do something great and do something with your sister. I didn't get a chance to do it right. I didn't get a chance to do it right. I, I tried, I, I came to try to rekindle, but my work, my time was up before I could finish the work. You have the work. You have the time. And you have the generations that don't have to wonder about it. So you were smothered. You are God to those children. The God they know is you and grandma. God and God's mother. And that's what they need. And that's what they want. And that's what they have. And that's how God and your ancestors designed it to be. So my connection with mother, she became a universal mother. And there were so many that I met on the path. Their lives were changed after losing a parent. I lost parents. My father and my mother, they both transitioned. So the horror had turned into healing. The pain is still there. Every November, we're going into November, the last time I saw my mother physically alive and well was November 20th through November 27th of 2009. 
No, excuse me, 2008. 2008. November. She was alive. She was well. She was teaching. She was vibrant. She was teaching people how to heal themselves. By February 5th, 2009, she was no longer in the physical world. This is November of 2008. By February, she had transitioned. She was translated, like they say in the book of Enoch. Or in Genesis, when it talks about Enoch, he died not, but he was translated. She was translated. So she left me with a charge. And she know I was hard headed. She know I I tried in everything to to get out of that responsibility of doing what it was and it took me some time and the horror it went from horror to healing and I had to get back in tune. With my family, I had to get back in tune with my siblings. I had to go just be in the presence. I had to hug them. I had to, you know, hear their stuff. Because when I left the world, I left them too. So I had to come back into consciousness of the world of living life. It's for the living. And if you're living life, those who transition, they transition to a higher form of life. The place that we were turning back to before we got here. So if we know living, we are living. And when they want to come back, they come back to us. So we must keep ourselves in this place that they're coming back to in the most optimal working order. So we must heal the world, like Michael Jackson said. Make it a better place for you and for me and the entire human race. We have to heal the world. We have to heal the earth. We must return back to mother nature, mother earth, and back into the fold of uplifting mother in all her various forms. For she is God and mother of all living. So, that is a mantra that I exist with, and that's my motivation to continue. The goals, the aims, and objectives that are here, you know, growing in the channel and scaling and all of those things, they're afterthoughts. The first thought and the last thought is mother. So in the spirit of my mother, it disciplines my behavior in regards to how I move in life and then how I move in the digital space. So that digital footprint you're talking about, I'm an ambassador to my bloodline, my entire bloodline. So because of my mother and wanting to see my mother's face, I got in tune with my ancestral work and now there's an army of ancestors and spirit guides that walk with me because of seeking my mother's face. So when it says, seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, and all of its righteousness shall be added unto you. In Islam, they teach that paradise is at the feet of our mothers. So seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, that womb that you came from, that mind that existed, that gave birth, that gave you water and shelter and nourishment in the womb. From this womb to this womb, out into this womb that we exist in. All of these things, we give honor and credence to her. And the more we fall away from her, the more we fall into error. So, for our mother, we gave credence to Father. Father never skipped a beat. We never, ever skipped a beat for Father, our Father, who art in heaven, Heavenly Father, Father, Father. What of our mother? Let's look at our mother. Mother is how he becomes Father. 
mother is how he becomes father and how he becomes son. So what of mother and what of daughter and what of sister? All have a destiny with mother, whether they have physical children or not. They have a destiny to mother something into this existence and out of existence. So honest and credence to mother, honest and credence to my mother and the universal mothers. If you guys haven't figured it out already, you should definitely be following and supporting this man in whatever he is doing. I want to end by saying you bless my soul. You bless my spirit. And um, I don't think that everybody is blessed and honored enough to just hear somebody and just want to change everything that they're doing because of something someone has said. That's not very, that doesn't happen often. We're, we live in a society, like you mentioned before, just the conditioning and everything just fast paced. And we don't have time to really process and think about what people are saying. but. I can listen to you all day and immediately I want to change everything I'm doing so that I make sure I'm intentional and that I'm doing things that are right, that are good and purposeful. Um, all of that said, tell us about the, the topics that you cover with the range of people you have on your uh, podcast. Tell us the name of the podcast and how we can support you on your journey. Most definitely. The podcast I have is called Do the Knowledge Radio. That's D O T H A. We'll start right there because I've seen the E's. I was like, who's that peeping in my window? Bad. Nobody now. Ain't like Atlanta. Ain't like Africa. Okay. Hey. K-N-O-W-L-E-D-G-E-R-A-D-I-O. Do Knowledge Radio. Our larger platform where Do Knowledge Radio is going to be the umbrella under is DTK Multimedia Production Company. And in that space, we have a literary arm uh, ebook series. Five books that are completed out of a 10-book series that's being created called Voices of the Diaspora series. And because I'm here with Miss Danny, she gets an exclusive, okay? An exclusive that we're working on right, 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 right now. Like right, right now. We are doing a docuseries, a web series entitled One Million Black Voices Uplifted from Around the Globe. So we're going to be on the road and sharing different stories from some of the people from around the globe. So we're going to be on the move. We're going to be physically out in places. It's, it's on the move. Docu-series, web series coming soon. So, yes, we're, we're after Black people for these stories, okay? We are after them. So the literary arm, Voices of the Diaspora, 10 volumes, five volumes completed, volumes one through five are completed out in publication and out in circulation. You can get those from my website, www.dothenowledgeradio.com. So they feature entrepreneurship, the old and honor to the black woman, honors to our mother. Volume three and four deal with revolutionary thought, and ideology, and volume five currently deals with science, technology, engineering, arts, and mathematics. So contingency operation from the inception of an idea through the various stages and cultivations, okay? So that's out and that's in circulation and you can get that bundle for $36. I'm telling you, if y'all sleep, y'all gonna miss it. Each volume is $9 individually. 
and it's five volumes, and I know that nine times five is 45. So you can get five volumes for $36. And y'all can catch me on all of the social media, uh, Knowledge Born Alive, or do the Knowledge Radio, and you'll find me. If you want to be a part of the series, you want your story to be told, you can email me at do the knowledge radio at gmail.com. Ms. Danny, thank you. Thank them lovely boys for their patience because I understand what I understand, what I understand. Okay, I have four children and at least 2,000 episodes, their voices are in there screaming, yelling, crying, breaking something, chasing after something, slamming doors, whatever it is. Okay, whatever it is, they're in it. All right. They are in it. So I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your love. I thank you for your kindness. And I thank you for another opportunity to grace your wonderful platform. I pray that the Most High continue to bless you and endow you with all of the ways to be successful and help others to be successful because you are a beacon of light. You are a beacon of hope. You are a beacon of strength, a beacon of motivation and inspiration to help those, to take those beautiful God divine ideas out of their mind and put it on the paper and put it into proper manifestation. So thank you. Thank you. And thank you so much. Thank you, King. And yes, you could say that 3000 plus episodes later, you know, it takes at the bare minimum, consistency, just taking that one foot, putting it in front of the other. So thank you. Um, I, this is one of those I get to like meditate on for a very long time because I'm sure every time I listen, I'm going to hear something different. Thank you. Thank you very much.